Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is John Hamry. We're glad to have you here. Uh, I understand we've got fires on the metro, so, they say, so we we'll probably have a few people that are delayed in coming, but uh, we look forward to having a few more join us here uh, this morning. Uh, before we begin, let me just say, when we do uh, events with outside guests, uh, we always begin with a little safety uh, discussion. I am your responsible safety officer. It's my job to make sure you're all <coughs> going to be well and safe. Uh, so I'd ask you to follow my directions if anything happens. Uh, the exits are right here, and back here and in that corner is the escape that goes down to, down to the street. We will go out there, we'll go across the street to the Beacon Hotel, and I'll pay for drinks. Okay, so let's so just follow me. I just ask you to follow me, and everybody's going to be just fine. <laughs> uh, well, I know you, and I'm not going to pay for your drinks. Uh, you know. Let's, uh, this is a real pleasure to welcome two colleagues. Uh, they, uh, they were the slowest guys in town, and I caught them and uh, uh, asked them if they would come here and, and spend some time with us today talking about, uh, about space. It's a, it's a topic that gets too little attention in the Washington policy community, and uh, we would like to try to correct that a little bit today. I won't spend a long time on backgrounds. Uh, Sean O'Keefe, I, I, I first met Sean back when he was, the, he was the chief clerk for the Senate Appropriations Committee, and then that took him in subsequent journey in life. He became the comptroller to the Defense Department, was the Secretary of Navy, and then eventually became the head of NASA, and is now with Maxwell uh, uh, up at uh, Syracuse University, I think 17th university professor ever, so, and we're glad to have him here at CSIS as a senior advisor. Uh, Jim Cartwright uh, started off as a pilot in the Marine Corps. Um, I was used to, I thought it was helicopter, but it turned out you're a, you're a fast burner. He was one of those guys that, you know, he was willing to have a rocket strapped to his butt and get thrown off of an aircraft carrier, which I've never figured out. Uh, but he's uh, been in my my life experience with him has largely been when he's he, when he became the uh, J8 and then ultimately became the vice chairman and uh, such a deep intellectual thinker about all things associated with kind of the cutting edge of defense for America. So we thought these two guys would be the best to help us think through uh, this rather confusing time. Uh, we were talking back before, we've got so much energy and innovation in the private sector, and yet it's hard to find a focus here for our government. Where, where are we going? Uh, the rest of the world is alive in space activity, and we're just kind of dieseling, and so we want to probably explore a little bit of that uh, today. Let me, let me just begin, uh, Sean, with you, and, and of course having been the administrator of NASA, uh, and I know that you keep current with it. And why don't you just just set the stage with your own personal thoughts and concerns right now, and then I'll ask the same of you, Jim, and then I've got some questions to dig in on. Well, I think as, as an opening you know, proposition, the changes we've seen occur in the broader dimensions of space access, exploration, and capacity to um, really engage in, in the broader space community, have in the last decade or so have encountered three really remarkable shifts in, in, in trend. The first is a, a continuous incremental improvement to chemical propulsion capabilities to propel rockets into outer space. I mean, it's a variant and a, a, a derivative of the same chemical propulsion capabilities that we've relied on since the Apollo era and before, uh, but it is now to the point of a much, much more extensive um, improvement in incremental capability that's lowered the cost as well as increased the performance in terms of the ability to, to launch uh, access and ensure access to space. The second is a, a major development, I think, in terms of the U.S. position of what I would otherwise call a loss of leverage by virtue of the fact that we have no secure access to space as a nation for any human being. Indeed, there is only one reliable methodology to access space through the Soyuz capabilities to 
uh, engage in crew return on the International Space Station, which operates 24-7, 365, and has for the past 15 years on that basis without interruption. It's been a remarkable track record, but the dependence that all of us across the globe now have on the Russian capacity to, to maintain that accessibility for human uh, exploration is uh, confined to that, that capacity. And the third, I think, development is probably the most remarkable, which is uh, what a couple of MIT uh, professors have, have written a book to describe as the second machine age. This is a defiance of the basic principle that there is uh, just a, a step function improvement in access to capabilities with each improvement or, or change that is introduced. The Industrial Revolution clearly being the first machine age, what they argue is now in the second machine age, what we're seeing is exponential growth in capacity by virtue of not only the means to accelerate the pace of computing, but also to make it readily accessible to anybody on a real-time basis. That combined with uh, all of the improvements to uh, make the, the capacity to access that information readily, to do so on a very extensive scale, and to then apply it to a wide range of applications or capabilities has, has remarkably shifted the scale to the point where we're going to see an incremental advance, they argue, in the course of the next generation here that's going to be exponentially faster than what we ever witnessed during the course of the first machine age. Because all those improvements in the access to information and the technology insertion is going to, to uh, step up that rate of capacity building. And it has other implications, they argue, but for this purpose, for the purpose of technology and information sharing and the ability to, to really capitalize on this, that has made a huge difference. And that in turn, I think, has mobilized, energized, uh, several entrepreneurs uh, to really invest in that potential and are making that opportunity, combined with the other two factors that I've just mentioned, uh, a, a more accessible market opportunity, potentially, if the right things fall into place. So those three factors, I think, are probably the, the driving features of what we've seen in the past decade. They're remarkably different from where we were in the middle of the last decade, to be sure, and at any point uh, in, the, in the recent past. Um, that sets the stage. I, I, <laughs> good, it does. Uh, Pause. I, you know, I, I think I'd like to pick up kind of where Sean left off um, and, and more on the national security or mo military side of the equation, but um, whether you call it the second machine age or the third offset strategy mm -hmm. or you pick it, I mean, basically at the end of the day, both of them are acknowledging that heretofore, if this country had a problem, military or otherwise, you built a platform to solve the problem. And it took you 15 to 20 years to, to get through that evolution to some level of reliability. And, and what this change has created is a construct in which um, if we can get through the, the social challenges of it, um, the opportunities for solutions, not just things, um, is exponentially greater than it is today. Uh, the third offset talks about robotics and autonomy, and immediately everybody's head goes to drones. But the reality here is that it is learning machines um, that are able to carry out our instructions um, and to adapt, which is really the key issue here, and to be resilient in environments that heretofore we really couldn't do it. And space is tailor-made to that kind of activity. Um, drones and cars get our nerves a little unsettled, um, which should tell us something about it in, the, in that it's the cultural issues associated with these kinds of transitions mm -hmm. and what they will do to established architectures <laughs> and established business cases are going to be hugely disruptive. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, you know, do, you, do you go hard now, which some people are just now starting to get into this market activity, 
um, or do you wait for it to all be settled out before you invest? And the problem is you can't leave the holes uh, in capability and space. But um, if you look particularly at the military um, uh, senior level schools and, and junior level schools at the papers they're writing, uh, they're talking about differences in warfare, which is their terminology for this activity uh, or their focus, but the reality of the ability to move from entities that um, uh, called Malay's uh, strategy where you know, it's just a bunch of people run into a crowd and fight amongst each other and then the last man standing is the winner to the second iteration and generation which was massing forces to the third generation which was maneuvering forces to now what is being discussed heavily is swarm. So in other words, entities talking to each other, controlled centrally in some cases for objective, but then being allowed to work. Think of on-orbit activities where assets talk to each other for a common purpose. It may be safety, it may be security, it may be functionality, calm, et cetera. Control what is being covered in footprints, et cetera. Um, and they are substantially smaller, but substantially smarter and asymmetrically so than they exist today. So what I'm trying to say is we're in that transition between an architecture that was useful and served us well in the basics of being platforms put up in space to do a certain function to an, an environment which can be disaggregated, move to problems, adjust to challenges, adjust to changes, be able to look inward at the Earth, and as the 2010 uh, strategy called for, outward, um, such that we're in space and beyond now, not just in space, um, and start to think differently about it. But trying to do that, whether it's at the commercial level um, or at the government level, incurs all of the rules that will ensure that we don't make progress um, I don't want to be pejorative to ITAR and, and, and other things, but, but they really are to lock in what we were doing, not the potential of what we could do. And to the extent that there are disruptors out there and things like SpaceX and things like other companies that are looking at fundamentally different approaches to how you might do business out there, both in near space and in far space, um, They've got to fight through not just uh, acceptance by, by industry in, in creating a business case, but they've got to fight through the cultural issues. You know, it's more, I mean, it's well known, you, you pick your poison here, but we as humans would almost rather fail than change, um, or we at least have to be threatened with failure in order to change. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a difficult road to hoe, uh, to get the changes that are going to be essential to do the work that we need to do, to get the competitive juices, to get the broad R&D base. It can't just be in NASA. It can't just be in the Air Force. Um, it's got to be a much broader base for the, uh, the uh, innovation that's going to be required. Uh, my last piece here, I mean, all of the strategies that have been written, <laughs> And I looked to the most recent Quadrennial Defense Review and National Defense Panel. In the Quadrennial Defense Review, I think there was somewhere around 60 iterations of, I've got a problem and the solution is innovation and there's nothing more in there other than that word. Okay? <laughs> and, and I think if you went to the policy text, you'd find that almost every policy ensures innovation cannot be used. <laughs> okay? That we must stay with what we are doing. And so, I mean, this is going to be difficult. We're, we tend to, to go at this, but we are at a point where the technologies are starting to become substantially real, yeah. and the opportunities are becoming sub more, far more substantially real. And the question is, will we allow that, and will we go after it? We've always had a divide in government between NASA and DOD, but we had patterns in the past to connect them. Uh, but in recent years, uh, it strikes me that we've lost the focus, especially in DOD, for uh, senior advocacy on space. Uh, why? Uh, I guess that one's mine, huh? It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I offer an uninformed view. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when, when we were both um, uh, serving, um, we had a group that met pretty regularly, uh, at least once a month, to get together and talk about what we're doing. And at that time, we were going through the transition for NASA in particular from an inward-looking architecture, comms, orbit, vehicles, everything else, to an outward-looking architecture, which DOD did not really see an essence or a need for at that point. And so they, there started to be a separation. We worked hard to not allow that separation to occur, but the, the goals were clearly substantially different um, at that point in architecture. And so it was difficult to partner in commsats. It was difficult to partner in, in many of the activities because the goals were fundamentally different. Uh, my sense is that's starting to come back together. Um, uh, you know, we're not trying to militarize space, but the, the architecture and the ability to do what we need to do is, is certainly coming back together in comms, coming back together in remote sensing in space. So in other words, a very sophisticated architecture, which you see um, uh, STRATCOM and uh, Air Force Space working hard at the Joint Space Operations Center to get something FAA-like up there and get it published. I, I saw just recently you know, that we had, used to have to go through some incredible gymnastics to advise China when they were launching of what was out there so that people or would not run into things. Uh, now that has been allowed to be direct, which is a, is a big step forward. But we need that kind of architecture, that kind of awareness mm -hmm. at a level of resolution that deconflicts not only the physical entities in space, but the electromagnetic mm -hmm. patterns that come out um, and deconflict all of that in a real time with some sort of authority and regimes and norms appear to be the approach rather than law. But, but that advocate inside of the department right now, I, the, the guy I listen to would be John Hyten um, out at, out at uh, Air Force Space Command. He just has the right vision. Well, I don't know what's the right, that's pejorative. He has a vision that seems to understand m many of these issues and the ex experience and credibility and authority to start to do things. And, I, I see a lot of progress out there. No, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by that because it, it's that's very uh, that's an ingredient I think that's essential in order yeah. to get this cooperative engagement working correctly. I mean, in my mind, I mean, this, the the notion that there's a separation or a dividing line between civil and military space is a policy issue, and it's one that is focused dominantly in that part of the debate. Since the origins of NASA in the late 1950s, the whole notion was this would be a peaceful exploration of the universe. You know, this was the objective. Now that was the, the public mantra, of course, but the reality and the reason why John Kennedy, you know, pounded so hard on the notion that we're gonna do this within one decade, get to the moon, was a demonstration of resolve and capability that served an entirely different purpose than simply exploration of the universe or as if that was simple, okay? But it, it was a stronger statement intended, I believe, for the purposes of consumption by those who lived on the other side of the planet, that if we can do this, imagine what else we could do when we set our minds to things. And there's gonna be a bifurcation and a separation of these things. We never wanna imply, even for a moment, that we'd ever wanna use this for anything other than peaceful, peaceful purposes. Now that, that notion has been perpetuated throughout the literature as well as the basic terminology ever since. The reality is there has always been a very strong kind of linkage between NASA and the Defense Department on very specific kinds of programs, capabilities, technologies, information sharing, so forth. That is not anything that's been secretive or sinister, it's more a notion that the idea behind how technology is developed, um, analyzed in turn, different processes explored, is open architecture literature at NASA. Go on the website, you can find anything you'd like that d dives into these kinds of questions beyond the, <laughs> the issue of, of ITAR applications and so forth. 
But the, the notion of capability is a widely accepted proposition within the civil space community, if you will, that makes an awful lot of information available that fits exactly with what General Cartwright just mentioned in his earlier comments of a shift in, in approach within the Defense Department from the notion that everything is platform-centric to then thinking in terms of capabilities and how they're inserted for application. And that becomes then a much broader uh, potential for applying technologies that are developed in a more you know, open source manner to leverage a broader range of capabilities that could be built into assets used for military means. The other way, I think there's been a lot of, of interconnection there where leadership has been shared between the department and NASA throughout the course of its history at varying intervals has been in terms of launch capacity and launch capability. There have been a lot of efforts, some that I think both of us were, were deeply involved in at various points of our respective time, uh, to try to find common ground in terms of where you meet those objectives. And in many cases, it, it, it failed, and just it, it was a divergence that couldn't be reconciled because of either weight, mass, capacity, something else that would drive the, the design that would put it out of the question for the other application. But in many cases, it worked very, on, on a very common basis. And in terms of operational use of assets and so forth, it's worked very well in terms of design of capabilities and so forth. That has really been uh, probably one of the more consistent success stories that you could trace in terms of application for UAVs, hypersonics, any number of different technologies that have been then applied to different purposes quite successfully because of that regular sharing arrangement. So it, it's, it, it's been a, a mixed story, but one that has to maintain, I would argue, from the, on the front end, that there is this division that when you get right down to it, isn't as sharp a line as what it would otherwise appear to be. And so the, the leadership question, I think, is almost a shared governance responsibility that has been generally, I think, uh, reconciled as time has gone by. And I, I admire uh, the commander of Space Command's personal vision and commitment, but you need somebody in Washington mm -hmm. that champions this, somebody in the Pentagon that champions this. I mean, sinks usually can't mobilize major resource directions. Yeah, um, you know, STRATCOM commander um, has, as when we shut down um, US Space Command, picked up that responsibility along with four or five others. Um, certainly for me at the time when we went through that, um, I had the advantage of already knowing the players and so that made it a little easier, but there's no question that the amount of time available to the STRATCOM commander is going to compete with cyber and nuclear weapons and just small things like that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge to get that focus there. Um, it's certainly there in the articulation of need, but it competes with everything else. So if your quota is 10 important things and they've got to range through all of those issues, that's, that's a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. We have never been successful, um, and it's one of the reasons I worry about a cyber command, we've never been successful at having domains be combatant commands. Okay, the services are organized by domains. The combatant commanders are organized by the art of war. <laughs> and so, you know, we're going to have to figure our way through this uh, to, to get the advocacy voice that we need, particularly in Washington, um, and particularly, you know, both on the joint staff, which is more focused on the warfighting capabilities, um, but also with, with the services and their domain responsibilities. Um, the integration of domains is a particularly challenging activity, so yeah. that makes it difficult. Yeah. I think it was um, oh, seven years ago that uh, uh, China demonstrated it could destroy a satellite um, in orbit, and since that time there have been quite impressive advancements. I think we probably think other countries might have some of this. How reliable is 
space, our space assets for us as a practicality these days. Do you, do you feel that we are, we can count on complete assurance of space assets if we need them in a future conflict? Well, um, the assurance side of the equation is, is the important part versus the reliability um, and the resilience to recover. Um, and um, maybe the ASAT test was a little bit of a, a reawakening because it's not something new. And um, it's an extremely expensive way to do business. So you're not going to do it in large numbers. And it's, for the most part, for low Earth orbit. Um, uh, but, but with the emergence of um, you know, new speed of light activities, you know, with directed energy, cyber, things like that, um, space is not so far away um, in time, you know, and in effect. And uh, so the, the threats that the architecture is trying to be resilient against are new, and you're dealing with platforms, again, that were built 10, 15 years ago, the great news is they've lasted 10 or 15 years. The bad news is they've lasted 10 or 15 years. And the threats in the world have changed. Mm -hmm. And so trying to organize an architecture that is resilient to these newer threats um, you know, is going to take some creativity of what you have on, on orbit and then a, a serious thought process, which is what particularly here in Washington and think tanks has been going on of what does a new architecture look like in an environment of the second, you know, second uh, machine age or whatever we're going to call it. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? How do we control it? And how do we obtain resilience? I mean, there are different techniques. You don't want to rely on just one because it could be defeated. But whether it's smaller and more, or whether it is focusing on assured launch and getting them up there and um, you know, repopulating quickly, whether it is servicing on orbit, um, adjusted, I mean, there's any number of, of strategies, all of which will probably require most space-based assets to be able to communicate with each other about the environment they're in, change that environment and change their objectives with a reasonable agility um, uh, which is just not there today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the laws of physics will still apply, I'm pretty sure, um, but we'll have to use energy to adjust. And uh, getting that energy on orbit and making it you know, smart and, and efficient as possible is the things of autonomy and robotics and mm -hmm. activities like that. It'll be interesting to watch that transition go, but we're in that transition. It's not something that hasn't started. The question is, you know, how disruptive it will be and how soon we'll get through it. It's, just to pick up on, on this point, it's a really powerful point that you're making, Jim. I think it's it, in that combined with your earlier comment of how policy that's as currently constructed today is designed to protect what we have and how we do things. And yet at the same time, the pace of change is happening so rapidly what we're doing is virtually guaranteeing that what we have is built in, controlled obsolescence. We own it, you bet, but it's also been far surpassed by whatever the technology is today. And the, and the best analogy to this one in terms of how you can apply that same thought process that fits the, the pace of uh, computing as well as capacity to share it on a ubiquitous basis that anybody can can utilize is when you look at the at the the developments just in the past decade plus where Instagram you know basic idea of how do you send a you know a photo uh, across the the internet to anybody you'd like of how, you know, the grandchild was just born or so-and-so's third birthday or whatever else, immediately was something that sold, just the thought, the concept, was sold for over a billion bucks for that purpose and became something that now is taken for granted we use all the time. Send that stuff around forever. Kodak at the same time went out of business because they anchored themselves exclusively on a proposition that you're gonna use a capability to 
perform an image on a piece of paper and share it that, may, that way. When was the last time you ever saw a photograph on a piece of paper that, you know, that something that you actually took? And so the entire enterprise, the whole structure went away as a result of just that one basic technology shift. That same thing is going to happen with regularity if you argue the point that this is now an exponential rate, Moore's law kind of application of, 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 of abilities uh, that's being applied within the information technology sphere. It basically means we're going to see this happen on a repetitive basis and we're going to have an entire inventory that, yeah, well, rather than saying, boy, that lasted 15 years, it's going to be, damn. <laughs> this lasted 15 years, and we can't base the argument on how to get rid of it, because the technology is now firmly developed to the point where anybody can overcome what we're using as a regular course. That's a real challenge, particularly in the manner by which the, the policy and the technology are coming into very, very profound confrontation. And you can see it this morning, or last night, uh, NASA posted um, at sunset here, picture of sunset on Mars at the same time, mm -hmm. the blue light of Mars in the sunset. And it's just, think of our other assets that take pictures and the idea that you could share even a sunset on the same day is foreign mm -hmm. <laughs> to our minds. You've, um, <laughs> both of you have referred uh, times to ITAR, you know, and I remember my time in government arm wrestling with the interagency process about technology release and cooperation with international partners. And it seemed we had a rather perverse basic philosophy, which was we will share technology, we'll allow American companies to partner with foreigners only when the American company can prove the foreigner already has the capability. You know, it was pretty dumb. <laughs> and it seems if we're going to have uh, I mean, it's becoming much more of a globalized industrial base. There's much more energy in foreign countries than there is here. It seems to me one of our problems is our own domestic security paradigm. Positively. How do we change that? And you, a, work, you worked on the space <laughs> station, Sean, so you found a way to bring international participation. I mean, yeah, this, but how do we deal with this? This is an incredible policy struggle. It's one that... Um, I guess probably the best description of this was uh, at one point I had the privilege of serving on Norm Augustine's Commission on Deemed Exports. And so I was one of that group of National Academy uh, uh, panelists. And after delving into the argument over deemed exports, which is just an intellectual property essentially and the, the transmission of information, uh, how do you control that? How do you deal with it? Within six months after our examination of the issue and traveling off to different places and looking at the question and talking to everybody. Uh, Norm Augustine uh, <clears throat> determined that the best thing to do would be to rename the panel the doomed experts, okay, because there was <laughs> no way to get past the intractable differences between the amazing ability and, and ease by which you can transmit information and yet this 1950s notion that we can control it if you put a big enough parameter around it and you know, post the Marines and get the armed guards out there, boy, we'll control that forever. And the answer is, you bet. It'll be useless information. We're doing a wonderful job of making sure nobody gets over time because of the pace of change and how this will occur. And, and so as a result, the only way that this is going to work right with all the effort at export control, you know, diminution and reform that's been really exerted over the past several years by this administration, started at the beginning of the Obama years and really accelerated during the course of that time, is, is really the idea that you're gonna erect much higher walls around much fewer numbers of things. Okay, you know, that's, that's got a, a, a neat kind of a public um, currency of here's how we'll redeploy our efforts and acknowledge the fact that a wider range of information is readily accessible anyway, so what are we doing trying to protect all that? Well, until we take the next leap that basically says, the fastest way to stay ahead of the problem is to always use this exponential rate of technology advancement as a means to overcome and conquer the prior generation of what we've got. And so readily make it available to anybody. You want this trash? It's all yours. 
Matter of fact, we'd like to see you insert it as often as possible because now we know how to defeat it. That's not likely to be a policy position that's going to evolve anytime soon. But it is the reality of how the technology pace is moving as, and information flow is moving as fast as it is, and it may be the only way to conquer it. In the meantime, we warm ourselves in the idea that if we build higher walls around fewer things, we're going to be just fine, thank you very much. That's a myth that I think is constantly demonstrated to be false. I, I think there's not much to add to that, really, but uh, <laughs> uh, to not um, overly demonize the ITAR people, uh, it is substantially better today than it was a year ago. Yes. Um, That's true. And, and, it's, and it is getting better, but it is, again, getting better on a construct of patent law, not on a construct of Morse law. Yes. I, well, Part of the problem is it's not way. just the munchkins that work the ITAR process, no, no. honestly. It's that both parties tend to try to demonize the other party if they make a mistake that they can exploit as mm -hmm. a national yes. security yes. risk. Absolutely. And until we become more mature, in saying, how are we going to save an industry we can't lose? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to address the political dimension where politicians have got to get smarter about what real risk is. And it's not just the, you know, is there an American mailing address to a U.S. company? Yeah, anyway. So let me, let, let me, let me move on. If I could uh, come back again to the space vulnerability. I mean, we, we tend to, because of the expense of getting to space, we tend to produce very high fidelity assets that go up because we want long life, we want lots of performance because they're very expensive, and of course that gives us critical nodes. Uh, is, uh, you both battled on this, I know, in previous days. Do you feel we're at the tipping point where a new architecture is possible, and who's leading the cause for a new architecture? Um, I, I, I believe we're at a we were at a tipping point probably five years ago at least that the path that we were on of, okay, it needs to be bigger because I need more fuel, I need more fuel, therefore it needs to be bigger, more fuel to make it work bigger, more computers, more mass, bigger launch vehicle. I mean, it just, we're at the point of we can't build it any bigger. Technology is limiting us and the cost of an incremental improvement is just, Unreachable at the you know at, at this point, and so you are at that point. You've you've passed that point. The question now is, what are the technologies that really are asymmetrically leveraging to change that equation? And and we talked about those as we started. But on orbit, you've got a lot of technologies that are commercially out there available and, and whatnot. But the issue of getting there, and 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 sustaining your position there and doing it in a way that you have maneuverability, which requires energy, um, is, is what people are chasing right now. And so whether it is reusable launch, which the shuttle kind of burned the trail for that um, in a very positive way, um, or whether it is reusable components to get us up there, new energetics to, to change the equations in different ways, but the thought process is how are we going to get things up there that can be sustained for longer periods of time, refueled, whatever, um, you know, and then can be resilient, and how we can respond to catastrophe, man-made or otherwise, um, in space is, is, is all linked into that. And so to me, right now, the, the leverage and the focus is in one camp on getting to space and trying to figure out how to do that in a far more economical way. And then once in space, introducing the, the second generation machine um, revolution uh, in a way that is useful and doesn't commit to, okay, if I put a satellite over place X, but place X is no longer interesting to me for whatever reason, why is an alternative for that satellite at an affordable cost? Yeah. You know, and, and, and moving around and thinking that way. Um, you know, we, mm. we tend to think in a single phenomenology with a single spot beam you know, of energy of whatever kind. 
And that's just not the way we're building um, architectures down here on Earth anymore, and it really shouldn't be the way we're doing it on space. Well, and it's this, there's an interesting uh, parallel, I think, on the, on the commercial side that is um, uh, very compatible with this same you know, challenge that's, that, that's being encountered. I think what you're seeing is development of communications capabilities, satellites, et cetera, that are vastly more um, capable. But as long as the cost to launch is always going to be the deciding feature, there's an awful lot of, you know, if you're in the business of looking for you know, growth industry, the warehouse business for satellites that are designed is a pretty, pretty good market right now because they're all waiting for at what point do you see that cost uh, reduced to the stage where you can, you can accomplish that. And that's coming. It's, it's, it's rapidly emerging. We're starting to see, I think, a very different uh, you know, launch capacity capability because, again, exactly as Jim described, um, the, the propensity to keep, it's got to be bigger to carry more fuel. You've got to have more fuel, so it therefore needs to be bigger. This, this closed loop argument is beginning to top out at the stage where folks are looking at uh, the capacity from a commercial launch standpoint to bet on the opportunity that cost will decline because lighter materials, part of the development, I think, of the, of the technology is a reduction in the weight of materials. Uh, the, the basic principles of how to launch it are about the same as what they've always been in the last 50 years, which is 90% of getting anything in, in low Earth orbit or out of space is getting off this rock. And so the capacity to, to develop the, the, the means to carry that much fuel for that purpose has remained a relative constant. But in the course of doing so, you can design the capacity, and this is what the commercial space industry is beginning to really go out and market as a new opportunity, is if you've got enough of a, um, uh, a demand captured as part of your basic framework, and you have a deep pocket enough entrepreneur who's willing to bet on the come that that's where it's going to go, you can reduce the cost to orbit by virtue of some of the newer design, modern, capable, contemporary, incrementally advanced improvements in the technology to launch. And that clearly is what SpaceX has achieved, is a means to take a contemporary current technology for the purpose of applying to basic conventional launch services, doing so in a much more you know, modern manner with advanced technology and with a baseline built in of assured government contracts that have been secured for cargo replenishment on the International Space Station for several years to come, uh, plus the commercial capabilities that are starting to come forward. That combination with a number of very, very you know, bet the, the, the farm kind of folks who are willing to take the risk to develop the assets to do that have really turned this into a market that's worth exploring to see where it's going to go. And the old notion that uh, somehow we were going to darken the sky with lots of communication satellites that'll make the ability to, to, to you know, pass from transfer information, that notion, quaintly, <laughs> articulated more than a decade ago, is right on the cusp of reality, and you don't need to darken the sky with it because you've got now capabilities that are dramatically improved from a satellite communication standpoint that could achieve that for a much lower cost based on the launch services that are available and, or could be available soon for the purpose of that cargo capability. So hosted payloads and numbers of assets being combined together for the purposes of deployment suddenly makes the cost of entry a lot lower and finally hits that price point or close to it that makes that opportunity bring the stuff out of the warehouse, put it on board, you know, HBO, whoever, you know, direct TV, get ready for the opportunity to really deploy at a much lower cost. And that's what they're selling. That's the argument they're advancing and it's that close to really, really happening in that case. How that translates into government intelligence community, satellite capabilities, et cetera, is going to be the, the stumbling challenge that we're going to be dealing with, and I think Jim has articulated very carefully. All the things you've got to do in order to protect the, the capacity for that information is always going to make it a heavier asset as a consequence of those uh, 
defensive deterrent mechanisms. Uh, one last question before I turn to all of you, and, and that is, uh, I think the last time we had a kind of a buzzword to try to capture a vision was when President Bush uh, talked about moon, Mars, and beyond. But for a combination of reasons, that didn't really take off, I guess, uh, to use another word. Uh, do, do we need a new vision that's going to mobilize government action? I think we see what the private sector is doing, but the private sector sees uh, genuine business opportunities, but I'm still looking for what's the vision that guides us from a national security standpoint. Maybe we don't have one anymore. And let me just ask you to reflect on that, and then we'll turn to the audience. I am, let me give you a terribly biased comment, because I was certainly there at the creation of a particular last articulation of vision by the President of the United States. Uh, and I, th I still think it holds true. What he argued and what often got confused with destinations was instead, how do you develop a capability to go, to go explore anywhere? Mm -hmm. Name your place, do, do, live it up, mm -hmm. Fig figure out where you'd like to go and what you think would be interesting out there, space scientists or just us looking at, at, uh, at the internet or you know, websites or whatever else. But the reality is today, we don't have the means to accomplish that is what his view was. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, identify what are, the, what are the limitations? What are the basic laws of physics that have to be overcome, <laughs> essentially, to accomplish any of those kinds of lofty ambitions of exploring anywhere beyond low Earth orbit? And that was the, 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 the framework of it. It then got tagged as, well, you want to go back to the moon, you want to go to Mars, you want to, well, shoot, that's, you know, in the greater scheme of things, that's like saying, I think we all ought to get up and go over to Arlington now. Because in, 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 the, in the overall continuum of the expanse of what there is to explore, the moon and Mars is like throwing a rock over to the next place. And if that was the scope of what the earliest explorers would have ever embraced, we would not be sitting here. Instead, this would have been deemed as too hard to find or too, or too tough to get to. Uh, and so as a result, you know, I think that the, the challenge is really looking at what are the, the underlying limitations which you have to accomplish those kinds of objectives. Now, mm -hmm. stepping past that broader philosophy, the reality, the limitations become the case of looking at the means to get anywhere. We've talked about that a fair amount. A lot of that is the means just to get off the gravitational pull that's required or that is, is present to get to any other place you'd like to go in space. That consumes a ferocious amount of resource, assets, capabilities, all of that to get anywhere. Second one is once you get there, we have no means to go any further than that. There is no real extensive in-space propulsion capabilities. We're still reliant, all of us globally, are still reliant on basic laws of physics and orbital mechanics of the means by which you arrive at any location is not by propulsion, it's by utilizing the basic laws of physics to achieve that. That, until we get to the stage where there's an in-space in propulsion capacity, we're going to be restricted to what those laws of physics and orbital mechanics tell you are the limitations. It sounds fast, but the distances are so vast that it really isn't. The fastest mean to get to you know, Mars, again, like going to Arlington, is not more than, you know, the fastest route is six months and back. So unless you want to just go there for the purpose of saying you've tried to go, you're going to consume at least a year to two years just achieving that round trip mission to Arlington in the solar equivalent of where we are. Uh, because there is no you know, potential to get there any quicker than that. So you gotta overcome that limitation. And then the last thing, I think this is a big deal, is, is the, the capacity of how a human being could achieve that goal. The answer is once you get past a certain distance, which is not too far from here, uh, your human effects and the consequence of that are so overwhelming that the likelihood that you're gonna come back in any condition that would represent that, if at all, is so low as to be de minimis. We've got to overcome the human factors challenges, the biological factor issues, physiological challenges that would otherwise be encountered in that case, you're never going, to, never going to achieve it. But the reality today, there's really only one, one mechanism left on this earth 
to launching a human being on a reliable, regular basis off this rock to anywhere else, and that's defined as 250 miles straight up, and that's going over to Kazakhstan, hop on a Soyuz rocket, pay the, you know, 25, 30, 50 million, whatever it is the Russians are charging these days, and you're on your way to about 10 days in space. That's it. That is the sum and substance of our ability to access any human being beyond low Earth, beyond the gravitational pull. All those were basically still at start, at, at beginning, of the means to accomplish that objective and not making a lot of improvement in that direction at all. Long treatise, but that basically comes down to the kind of strategy and philosophy that has to be articulated is to go back to the basics of saying, what is it that, that motivated human beings as, a, as an instinct to want to explore and know what's on the other side of the ridge? And until we yield to that again, which we have throughout the course of human history on a repetitive basis, until we yield to that and say that's, that's the means we're going to accomplish this, and here are the problems we've got to overcome to achieve it, we're basically going to be stuck where we are. Uh, my sense, if you're looking between now and 2030, 2040, um, it's, it's going to all revolve around the word assured. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where the investment, particularly in near space, is going to be. Um, the, the transition that will go on during that period, I mean, my crystal ball is no better than anybody else's, but if I were a betting man, it will be on the commercial side for commercial product, um, whether that's in near space or whether that's going to some other celestial body and mining it um, and bringing it back, it'll be subject during that period mm -hmm. to the things that, that Sean has just talked about, but that will create the investment opportunities to start to change fuel, energetics, launch, movement to and fro other places. Uh, and it's more likely to be um, through that venue that we develop the capabilities um, that would allow then exploration well beyond what is mm -hmm. physically possible today. Um, and we can do those things between now and then remotely, so to speak, um, with vehicles. I mean, we're, we're already now seeing substantial activities occurring around mining here on Earth. Uh, if you go look at Volvo and some of these other, they're driving their vehicles from a central location at the factory in a mine in Brazil um, and mining and doing one of those types of things. And so the, the technologies are already starting to be developed that would enable this kind of activity. And so for the next 30 or 40 years, my sense is, if there is a source of resource, dollars and cents, that's going to come, it's more likely to come in quantity and with capability out of this commercial sector than it is out of the government sector. OK, let's open this up for a conversation. Yeah, we can take a question right here, and we'll come back here. We'll bring a microphone down to the third row. Uh, well, you go ahead, and then we'll bring it down here. You'll get the next one. That's thanks. Let me jump the gun there. Uh, Victoria Sampson, Secure World Foundation. Uh, neither of the panelists mentioned something that I think is really crucial for continued access and resiliency of our space capabilities, and that's international cooperation. What are the challenges and opportunities for the United States to work with international partners on our space program? Thank you. Well, I mean, the one, the one we have been, been really pursuing in with great zeal and success, I think over the past 15, 20 years, is the design, construction, deployment, assembly, and now operation of the International Space Station. This comprises a, a partnering consortium arrangement of international partners of 16, I believe, 17 nation states across the globe. Uh, the Canadians, the Japanese, the Russians, the United States, and the International Space Agency, which comprises its full complement of nation states that are participants. And I believe to date, uh, you know, most, if not now all, of those nation states that are all part of that consortium for that 
colossal laboratory in space that is now fully complete and operational with a crew consistently of a half a dozen at least uh, members of the crew on, on any given day, at any given time, you name it, operating from all the different countries that are involved, and it's a constant rotating effort, uh, is probably the most extraordinary international cooperative engagement that we have ever attempted and has worked uh, very, very successfully. I'm, I'm convinced to this, to this day that it is one discovery away from being the next wonder of the world. I mean, it is a astonishing capability to work uh, in a microgravity condition with a wide range of different scientific experimentation uh, challenges that are common to all of us across all those nation states that are participants, uh, that once that particular breakthrough occurs, this will become the next darling of the scientific community that discovered that particular capability. And it's, it's close. I think there's any, any time now you're going to see that kind of, of a result occur. But that is one amazing achievement that really, by and large, most people aren't even aware of, despite lots of efforts to talk about it and engage it and you know, having the means to, uh, to communicate verbally you know, <laughs> by voice with the crew members at any time, at all times, and the fact that it comes around uh, every 90 minutes, just check out the NASA website, it'll tell you where it'll be, you know, and where you can see it, you know, it's just an astounding capability and one that uh, really has worked as a cooperative engagement, even with the, the, uh, the political tensions that have occurred between and among nations over the course of that same, you know, decadal period of uh, that time. Uh, we've overcome that in order to maintain efficient and consistent and assured operations without interruption for that span of time uh, with all of those cooperative partners in, involved. It was a, it's one heck of a story. Um, two examples that need to be improved on but are out there. One is the paradigm of the past was, and unfortunately still for the U.S. government, is if you build a particular rocket, you can also assure yourself that you've built the launch spite sites. In other words, the two are linked. They're not delinked. But in the commercial sector, both in the United States and globally, the, the rockets move to the most advantageous launch site, uh, and they're not dependent on a singular launch site or a single country for that, and that's, that's a big move. And the second one, I think, uh, that's really important just getting going is the, uh, I probably don't have the acronym right anymore, but the commercial integration cell um, out in uh, Vandenberg that now deconflicts commercial uh, physical space and, and electromagnetic um, for all willing countries and will give that information to any country that asks for it. Um, that's a big step forward. It's going to grow. It's only going to grow. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to, you know, reduce the number of players in a particular activity, launch or on orbit management, et cetera. That's all become global, and it will continue to move in that direction. Okay, the, right down, uh, third, right down here, the third from the front, and then we'll come over here after that. Hi, uh, this is Chen Weihua, China Daily. I'd like to like, continue on this international cooperation exchange. And you mentioned the International Space Agency uh, Station, which uh, U.S. and Russia continue the cooperation even after Ukraine. And uh, U.S. and the Soviet Union cooperated even in the dark days of the Cold War. But now it seems that China is being treated worse I mean, than the Soviet Union. Even no one in this town seems to suggest that China is a worse enemy than the Soviet Union. I mean, and uh, I, I want you to talk about, uh, as a former NASA chief, your view on this Frank Wall fact, which forbids uh, cooperation in space between China and the US. And uh, do you agree with that? Do you think uh, the politics here is going to change for the better or worse? Thank you. Now, this, is, this is a matter where, again, um, as so many times in this conversation, we've talked about the, uh, the challenges of reconciling the pace of capability with policy views. 
Uh, and while I will not speak to the question of whether or not or why uh, the existing relationships with, uh, with China uh, are as they are, I think some of the folks that are you know, far better informed to speak to the matter reside a little bit south of here by a few blocks, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, but the, the reality is, I think the, the, the relationships have improved. There's a lot more discussion back and forth over the capabilities. But I think what's really consistently um, stymied the ability to broaden that rate of exchange has been the deep suspicions on both sides of what the intentions are and what the capabilities are, and the concerns over industrial espionage and every other issue that clouds the debate consistently. And then ultimately what the intentions of that set of arrangements would be. Um, the, as you suggested in the question, the, the normalization or improvement, I shouldn't say normalization, there's nothing normal about it. The improvements of relationships between the Soviets now, the Russians, uh, over the course of time didn't happen overnight. This was something that had been building for a considerable period of time. And it was an avenue, a means, a mechanism to start that dialogue. Looked at in that same context, we're at about the same rate of that change from a policy standpoint with China, I think, as we were with then the Soviet Union that has progressed in that time. And, and you're right, it has withstood largely the kinds of challenges with independent of the, 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 uh, the political atmospherics of the time uh, to make that relationship mature, however very slowly. And that's, I think, going to be replicated or maybe replicated uh, across the, uh, the board as well with both the Chinese as well as with the Indians. I think those are two very important features that uh, are on the verge of seeing, I think, an improvement in China as well as India on our relationships there because of the realities of where we see the, uh, the pace of change occurring. Huh? I, I mean, I would follow um, probably Kissinger's um, axiom of uh, with China, of try to get at the low-hanging fruit, the things that are easy that we both agree need to happen. Start there, and, and, and space awareness is a key area for that. So start working in that area, build the confidence and the mechanisms that allow tr transparency, don't, don't inhibit the ability to trust each other, um, and move along those, those lines, uh, probably. And so again, I, I kind of come back to that's, that's the thought process here. You know, and awareness is something we both desperately need. It's something that neither one of us could afford at the, you know, solely at the detailed level. And so it only makes sense to start to cooperate there um, because of the economic leverage we'd get out of it and the leverage that we'd get out of our space capabilities by being able to do that. And I, I think that's where we start. General Paul down here in the front, please. Oh. Uh, good microphone to you here, Terry. Government has made some extensive uh, encouragement into satellite communication, encouraging them and uh, imagery to expand their use uh, out in space. There's been some disappointment by those who've made that investment that the usage of it is not there yet. Is that encouraging to come, or we are where we are? Uh, the, the, the hope and the, the, um, the bet on, on uh, more reliance on commercial rather than uniquely governmental um, communications capabilities um, is technically, we could have done that 10 years ago, quite frankly, but, but now the requirements and the bandwidth, et cetera, are creating an imperative. Um, I would say the government's still a little bit in denial on that imperative. In other words, they believe they can satisfy all the requirements um, internally. Um, and, and, you know, a business case is there. The problem with it is it tends to be episodic, mm -hmm. and that's hard for business to respond to. And so with the newer satellites, with the more maneuverable satellites and the more maneuverable footprints, it really puts commercial industry in a place to, to take up that burden, build a business case, 
between their commercial partners and their governmental partners um, to move bandwidth on demand around the planet. As that starts to mature and the launch side starts to make it even more feasible, because again, I think commercial will find that before government finds that, it'll be very hard to justify why we're not using more commercial. The question is, just like with other SpaceX uh, and other companies, are the pockets deep enough to wait for that promise? And, and of course, the promise is, oh, just next budget cycle, it'll be there, and you know, industry can go dry waiting for the right budget cycle to finally come. Um, but uh, the momentum and the inertia and the technologies are all in favor of the commercial side of the equation on this. Um, now, what the commercial sector has to do that they can't avoid, quite frankly, for their own good reason also, is hardening of those assets to be resilient against, you know, at least raising the price of trying to come after them in either cyber or directed energy or other types of threats um, so that they, are, they do generate some level of resilience uh, probably higher than where they are today. Uh, right here in the second row, please. And yeah, then I'll come over here, John. Uh, I'm Soichiro Asada, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry America. Uh, I used to be engaged in uh, Japan space program for more than 30 years. Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, exploration on the moon. Uh, United States is not interested in uh, exploration on the moon anymore, but on the uh, Mars. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China uh, has a plan to explore the, on the moon, and we sent a uh, human being to the on the moon. Uh, I'd like to know the reason why you are not interested in uh, uh, moon. Um, my understanding is that uh, you sent a human being more than 50, almost 50 years ago, and you found nothing on the moon. Uh, you uh, understood uh, moon is uh, moon is not useful for the for the United States. Is that true? It's all yours. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, this this gets wound into the you know the the destination arguments over where do you want to go and what's the right place to, why would you want to go there, whatever. Uh, and it, it, inevitably, it turns on the kinds of debate of what's the value add of achieving this particular destination versus another, whatever. And yet the reality, the baseline argument is you can't get to any of these places anyway. Or, or to get there, you've got to expend a tremendous amount of energy, effort, resource, capacity, all that for what then will become argued as a limited set of objectives. Now, that's the wrong way to think about this. Because again, I think part of what we've been wrapped up in and frankly stuck at, at standstill over is debating what, what is it we think we will discover there? Well, you know, if the proposition were like that posed to Lewis and Clark, they wouldn't have gone, okay? <laughs> it would have been just a curiosity-seeking adventure. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, you know, you can trace any number of exploration missions towards that goal until you can set up the capacity to actually understand what the range of um, uh, potential may be. You're not gonna know. And we're lear we've learned a whole lot more, to be sure, about the lunar surface, about Mars, about lots of different uh, of, of celestial capacity, I mean, bodies within this particular solar system. But again, we're talking about on the periphery of anything. We're, st we're still looking at, you know, a, a, a set of planets around a very old star that's not in, in the downtown Milky Way, you know, category. It's on the periphery of this galaxy. And yet there's an entire universe beyond that that we know little, if anything, about were it not for our ability to use a telescope to be able to visualize what happened in the past. That's about the extent of what we know right now. So until we set up the capacity to access it on a regular basis, you're not going to do it. Now, one argument that I've always found compelling as to why it's worth the time 
to uh, establish a regular access means to get to the lunar surface, is once you get there, you defeat the problem I talked about earlier of 90% of going anywhere is off this rock. The consequence of launching from that rock is a whole lot less because you know, the, the gravitational pull there is so much more navigable means to accomplish that task, put in a very simple term. So as a result, if you want to go somewhere else, anywhere, you name it, the means to get there from there is a whole lot easier than getting there from here. Once you've achieved that, that goal, you've set up the capacity to stage it, to, to do the kinds of things necessary, uh, to support future missions, it becomes a really readily accessible launch capacity and capability from the moon than it does here on the surface of this planet. So, you know, th there's a lot of basic logistical reasons as well as scientific reasons to continue that exploration. But that's not good enough to be a sound bite to motivate folks to say, let's go look at that potential because it sounds like a excursion for yet another ill-defined purpose. And so therefore, why don't we just hold off on that until we have a better understanding. And that's consistently been the, the challenge we need to overcome. That until we can establish something that universally could be accepted as why you'd want to go back there, it has been, been kind of put in the category of been there, done that, got the t-shirt, enough is enough, we don't need to go figure out what else is there because we already know. Well, we're kidding ourselves into understanding what it is we, we know which is change and accelerator over the course of time. Plus, we haven't really thought more, more broadly about what the potential could be of being there versus here. Right down here, right down the front, please. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, on the one hand, you know, we've got all of this talk about opening things up, making things faster, more cooperation, but on the other, we've got uh, General Hyden and uh, Bob Work talking about uh, increased space control, another $5 billion in the IC and the government on this. Um, and we've got uh, a fair range of, uh, I won't call them Luddites, um, but folks on the Hill who uh, have a very static view of life because they're afraid of making a mistake. Um, how do we square all of this in the next 18 months? We've got the RD-180 debate on the Hill. You know, we've got all of these essential conflicts between policy and politics, and then we've got you know, China and Russia on top of it as a threat. Um, I'm not expecting a simple four-word I know how to do this <laughs> answer, but uh, is, what kind of way ahead is there? Well, um, I'll, I'll start and you can think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maria. <Marie. laughs> you left me out of the equation. You know, I'm tired of it. Uh, I mean, one, um, while people on the Hill probably aren't steeped in the engineering side of it, I think they have gone a long ways in understanding the broader issues associated with it. So I. Um, and, and I think they see, uh, certainly I, I feel that some of these issues are worth taking on right now because there's an, a, an alternative. So what do you do about launch? What do you do about commercialization of, of capabilities that the commercial sector can easily handle given the opportunity? How do you start to think about that? Um, how do you start to think about alternative architectures without getting drifting way off you know, into never, never land here and imagining things that won't be happening. So, you know, yours, it's easy for us to sit here and talk about 20 years from now. It's much harder to talk about next week. And, and that's what you're trying to get at. And my sense is that um, we're, for the most part, sticking with what has been successful up until now, awaiting the opportunity and trying to incentivize the opportunity for some sort of 10x improvement in architecture and launch, et cetera, um, and not trying to chase that before the risk is, uh, until the risk becomes manageable. Get those risks down to something realistic. 
Um, you're starting to see that in the, in the structure of the bus. Um, you're starting to see that in how people are thinking about hosted and diverse payloads and maneuvering uh, both the, the payload and the vehicle. You're starting to see that in the launch vehicles um, in, in how people are trying to, one, go to the best site, two, figure out how to recapture as much um, uh, in the expendable, uh, out of the expendable regime that you can, whether it's recovering the first stage, recovering the payload, whatever. You're starting to see DARPA work on things like resurfacing or servicing on orbit um, to allow us to have the energetics that are necessary to do things differently. So the technologies are in those show me and work off some of the technical risk um, stages right now and are likely to stay that way um, you know, in a broad statement for the next few years, although there are areas like bus structure, payload structures, things like that that are really already starting to emerge and, and for which there are good commercial examples of how you could, instead of a government, you know, wholly government activity, start to get a commercial activity and get the technologies at a rate that are more associated with Moore's Law than with patent law. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're, we're consistently stuck with where the, the policy is limited by our abilities to collaborate, cooperate on a broader political level. I think you phrased that properly. Um, and that has become the chief impediment on a public objective to achieve the kinds of things that I think General Haas Cartwright has just uh, enumerated. Um, and if, if you had to bet, the places where we're going to see a paradigm shift or a policy referendum or something that's going to change that view is largely because, uh, you know, folks named Branscom and Bezos and uh, Musk and Bigelow and people like that don't feel inhibited by that. And they've got, oh, by the way, you know, the capacity to actually support their ambitions in those directions. And it, isn't, it doesn't become a public referendum when they fail, and they will. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just no question. This is, this is hard stuff. This isn't easy to do to begin with. And again, I, you know, John used a, a very apt expression of uh, you know, questioning you know, my, my good friend to my rights of, of senses when he decided to become a marine aviator to strap himself onto a rocket. Well. Take that by a factor of a bunch, and anybody who wants to get aboard a controlled explosion that's going to hurtle you into space in eight and a half minutes, uh, and then when you get there, you're basically, you know, past the G forces and everything else. That really is a questionable judgment. You were really saying about your view. I want to come to your defense on that one. This is, I mean, he was playing it safe. Finding folks and, and the, 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 you know, the, the zeal to want to do that is now no longer a public domain because the nature of the policy and the acquisition system and everything else is all about how do you develop, you know, design, develop, and produce things for which you've reduced the risk, which therefore means a long time. Yeah. And the tolerance for any setback on that has become progressively harder yeah. and harder to overcome as a public debate. Again, once those other entrepreneurs go accomplish this, as we you know, just tragically saw happen in the Mojave Desert here in October of last year, uh, this is a, a, you know, a, a real horrific tragedy. It's befallen the, you know, the virgin galactic attempts to try to accomplish this. But it isn't going to be something that's going to turn into a public referendum about whether they should even be permitted to try. Right? And they're going through all the challenges that you have to deal with with a setback. And they're doing it admirably and with great you know, diligence and so forth. Trying to accomplish that when a public setback of that proportion is made, it brings you to a grinding halt. Been there, done that one too. Okay? And it's, it's a real hard sell, and it's a difficult thing, and it takes a lot longer to convince anybody 
that we as a public ought to go run out and take that risk again, because much like some of the earlier questions, you've got to demonstrate why you assumed that risk for whatever goal you think you can achieve. And if it isn't specific enough, it fails in the public argument. The entrepreneurs, they don't need to pass any of that, except to the extent that they've got limited resources or they've got a board of directors that poses the same argument. And that's what's going to move us Potentially, that's going to be a catalyst that will move us in a different frame in our debate in the time ahead. And that's to be celebrated. That's an that's a element that I think is going to be uh, a tremendous achievement. And there are fortunately enough people out there interested in taking that kind of risk to accomplish those kind of goals. And we may yet see some interesting breakthroughs that changes the paradigm of the, of the discussion as well. We can take one last question. Right, right down here, please. Right in the front, and then we'll... I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see if, we get this. if it's a short question, we might get another one. Short question. My name is Pavia Lal from the Science and Technology Policy Institute. You've mentioned a whole bunch of high-level policy changes, which are all great. Can you come up with a few specific action items that agencies can take in the next 18 months or so that would you know, that are specific, not just general, broad policy changes? Uh, I think on the awareness side, um, getting, getting the complete data package out and make it public. Today, on a website, you can go and see bodies that are orbiting the Earth or debris that's orbiting the Earth. But it's in, you know, it's kind of like the space station. At 9 o'clock, it'll pass over you. That's about as much as you get. You need much more comprehensive data. We need to get that out. We're worried that that somehow compromises us, but quite frankly, we just need to get that information out to improve the awareness. Get, get a policy associated more like what the FAA has than what we're doing right now in space. So that, that would be one. Two, um, as we talked about a little earlier, really take a good look at ITAR. Um, and we're looking at it from the lens of protecting our knowledge and our, what we perceive as advantage. Everybody else has knowledge and advantage. You know? So this is something that you, know, you could do independently, but you'd much rather do in a, an alliance type of approach. In other words, I'll share with you if you'll share with me. You know, it may not be in kind. It may be that, for instance, Japan has one set of knowledge that we would like just by their physical location, maybe potentially, you know, scanning the sky or, or a technical knowledge from their launch capabilities. Um, when we get to that point, then that needs to be a much more comprehensive sharing activity um, and do the same with China, et cetera, and start to look for groups of willing and push in that direction. So those two areas, I would say you can do that very quickly. Um, we need to then declare in a pub more public way for commercial assets how do, you, how do you compete? Lower the barriers to competition for government contracts uh, and allow them to compete um, without you know, some of the barriers that exist today. Let me just give you one quick example. Uh, there was, uh, among the many very interesting things I had the great privilege at NASA to do, uh, was to you hear all manner of ideas, some of which, a lot of which, really way off the mark and you know you thank you very much for your input and in other cases it, you get some interesting stuff that comes from it. And this one came from Tom Cruise of all people who came in and visited uh, the offices one day and he's a big space nut and a whole bit and he told me you know you've got this great website with all this information on it and it's perfectly designed for a lot of research faculty across the globe I, I, I guess that is going to be of interest to them. But to the rest of us, it's three clicks to oblivion. You go to the next thing, and then you know, you find yourself nowhere. And he said, how about I loan you one of my tech heads, he calls them, uh, who designed my movie trailers to take what you've already got, all the information that's already here, and just make it more readily accessible. So I took him up on the offer. And it changed the, the appearance of that website in a way that made it inviting, interesting, 
Folks wanted to participate, you know, here it is, it jumps out at you. And all it was was a platform, just a means to access the information that's already there in a friendlier manner. That's gotten nothing but better since that time. So I would invite you, anytime you like, take a look at the website and you'll get an inventory of current examples of how these kinds of cooperative efforts are underway right now because it is that much more available than it's been. And I, every time I encounter situations like this of trying to, how do you make the information available? I gotta thank Tom Cruise for his, his you know, blinding flash of the obvious to say, how do you take what's already available, forget about all the regulations would prohibit it, just make it easier for anybody to see. And that's exactly what NASA's done and I think they've done a brilliant job with exactly that. Colleagues, I'm sorry, we're <laughs> at the end of the time. I'll let you individually approach our two speakers, but would you thank them with your applause? This was really a very... <laughs>